Welcome everyone to this afternoon's webinar. Uh, today, pesticides and insect pest control in vegetables. My name's Carl Larson from RMCG, one of the uh, delivery partners along with AHR in the Integrated Crop Protection and Soil Wealth uh, projects nationally in the veg industry and they're funded by Hort Innovation with the Veg Levy and co-contribution from the Australian Government. We're lucky today to be joined by Siobhan DeLittle and James Maino from Caesar, uh, deputising for Paul Yumina, who unfortunately couldn't join us today, but uh, a wealth of knowledge on the line um, and also the chance to interact, ask questions during the session. Before we do make a start, just some housekeeping. You'll notice uh, if you haven't joined us on one of these webinars before, your side panel on the right uh, is your control panel and, and centre of uh, all things interaction. So you can see who else is on the line. Um, also raise your hand and ask questions throughout the session. You can type those and they'll come directly to me. We can put those to the team uh, throughout the presentation or we can hold them off till the end. So please, if you've got a burning question, type it in and send it through. You also notice that there's a handout uh, panel there on the sidebar, we've got a couple of really handy resources that are related to the webinar content today that you can take away with you. Uh, so a couple of fact sheets on uh, the strategic agrochemical review process back in 2014 uh, for both brassicas and carrots. There's also a, a green peach aphid resistance management strategy that Caesar's developed that we've got there for download. And also some broader um, fact sheets and guidance on brassica white fly control and also managing pesticide resistance. So feel free at any time during the webinar to click on those PDFs and they should download onto your machine locally and you can take those away from the session. Um, the webinar is recorded as well. So if you did want to revisit uh, any aspect of today um, and access those presentation slides, they will be up on the Soil Wealth and ICP website afterwards. What we find useful uh, before we start these sessions is to ask everyone on the line um, how much experience they have in the particular topic. So in this instance, pesticide and insect pest control and vegetables. If you wouldn't mind now just answering one of the four options there around how much experience you do have, lots, a bit, not much, or none, keen to know more. That just gives us a really good understanding of where people are up to on the line and how to pitch some of the concepts that are coming in the presentation content. So I can share those results back to you. Um, so a really even split across the top three categories. We've got about a third, a third, a third with lots of it and not much and none at the bottom end. So that means we can pitch you know, questions, comments, discussions at a bit of a higher level today, which is great. Um, and now over to Siobhan and James to take us through the presentation. Thanks, Siobhan. Great. Thanks very much, Carl. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, so I'll just jump straight in. Um, I'm going to start off by talking about the different pesticides that are available for use uh, in the vegetable crops in Australia. So uh, as per the poll, I've seen like quite a few of you know a lot about this. Um, I'm going to pitch it perhaps more at a lower level, but feel free to take away what information you need at any level. So there's basically heaps of information out there. There are a lot of different products that are available for controlling different pests in, um, in different vegetable crops, and the information can get a bit confusing at times. So if we look specifically at the specific chemicals that have been created by the agrochemical companies to target different pests, we have the active ingredients. And there are different active ingredients um, Across the board, they target different pests and they target different places in the same pest. So say we've got a typical pest in aphid here and we have a couple of different active ingredients here or chemicals that have been targeted to control that pest. So some of them are going to hit one part of that pest. So it might be the nerves or the muscle groups or it might be the hormones or the development of the pest. And what they're going to do is they're attacking that part of the biochemistry of the pest and that's the way that they'll, the mode of action they'll use to kill that pest. And other active ingredients, other chemicals are going to target a different part of the pest. So you can have this bi-pronged attack by using the different types of active ingredients to attack your pests. 
So the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee, the IRAC, have, have grouped these different types or categories of active ingredients into different mode of action groups. So they're based on the mode of action by which they attack the pest. So some, like bifenthrin and alpha-cyphermethrin, the pyrethroids, tend to affect the nerves and the muscle groups, and others, like spinetoram and spinetad, they affect different areas in the pest. So they can be grouped into these mode of action groups. So if we go back to our first table, then we can see we have a host of active ingredients that are categorized into these different mode of action groups. And the mode of action groups are really the key when you're looking at what you want to use to control your different pests in your crop or control resistant pests in your crop. So then we look at, we've got products as well. So there, the product trade names are often quite different from the names of the active ingredients or the names of the mode of action groups. And this is where it can get a bit more confusing because often you can have several different products that will have different trade names but will have the same active ingredient. So for example, I've underlined here, we've got Comfidor and Nuprid, which are two different products that are available to control aphids and vegetable crops, but they both have the same active ingredient that is used to control the aphids, which is the imidacloprid. So just looking at an example of a few different product labels I've put up here, I've got the Nuprid and the Comfidor labels as an example. And when you're reading the label, you can actually look and see, yeah, what is the active constituent? What is the active ingredient? It's a metacloprid here. Um, and then also it will have the IRAC mode of action group quite nicely in bold on the label as well. So that's an important one to look for to see what the different mode of actions are. So obviously for these two products, it's the same mode of action group because they're the same active ingredient, the metacloprid. If we look at the two DuPont labels now, we've got Corrigin and Benevia there. Um, they actually have different active constituents. One is the chlorantronilipol and the other is the cyantronilipol. But both of these different active ingredients affect the same area in the pest and therefore have been classed in the same mode of action group. So that's the group 28s or the diamides as they're commonly known. So again, even though we've got different trade names and actually different active ingredients here, by looking at the mode of action group label on your product label, you can look to see whether you're using a different mode of action. Finally, we have Mavento, which is different again. It's got a different active constituent, spirotetramat, and it's from a different mode of action group, which you can clearly see here, it's group 23. Are there any questions around that kind of labeling? None that have come through uh, from participants at the moment, so feel free to type those in. I mean, more of a comment, Siobhan, that it is uh, good just to revisit some of these uh, labels. Sometimes uh, they are better known by, by their trade name rather than the actual, actual active constituents. So a, a really good reminder just to be looking out for those. Great. Thanks, Carl. Um, so talking about different mode of action groups and the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee, um, how does pesticide resistance evolve? Essentially you start off with this awesome synthetic chemical that's been developed by an agrochemical company that can help you target a pest in your crop and to remove that pest and therefore remove the damage to your crop. Um, and at, at the first, when it's introduced, there's going to be a high um, mode of activity. It's going to kill all of the pests. Obviously, if you have a look at this little leaf here, we've got some pests that are quite sensitive to that, that product, and also there'll be some background variations. So some of the pests in that population may already have some tolerance. There's gonna be variation across your pest population. So after your first spray of that product, yep, you're gonna kill most of your population, but obviously the guys with the higher natural tolerance are going to survive. If you keep on applying that same product, that same active ingredient, or even in some cases, that same mode of action group, you're going to basically kill off all of the select, the sensitive members of your population and end up selecting for these guys that have the tolerance to the chemical until eventually your chemical is not going to be able to control your population anymore and you've ended up with a fully resistant insect population. So there's sort of a basic recipe for how um, pesticide resistance evolves. First of all, you have to have your selection pressure. So that's the constant repeated application of the same product 
the same active ingredient, or even in some cases, the same mode of action group. If you repeatedly apply that same product, you're going to select for the insects that are able to survive that product. It's like an evolutionary arms race, I guess. Um, the insect pest also already needs to have the genetic propensity to be able to deal with toxins. So for example, green peach aphid is a highly polyphagous pest. You can find it on most different plant families, most of your vegetable crops, you'll find green peach aphid in there. What that means is that these guys already have the ability to deal with lots of different plant toxins that you can find in all of these different plant families. They have the genetic tools, the biochemistry to be able to detoxify all of the different compounds that are found in these different plant chemicals and therefore basically have the genetic toolkit that can allow them to work up detoxifying different agrochemicals that might be sprayed against them. So that's the second part of the recipe for pesticide resistance, evolution. The third part is pests that have a really high fecundity, so lots and lots of offspring. If they lay hundreds of eggs or they have asexual reproduction and can have a very fast turnaround from adult to nymph, and a really quick generation time means that they have the possibility of having that generation turnover much faster and that they can um, therefore have that final kind of key ingredient for the evolution of pesticide resistance. In order for resistance to evolve in a species, you really need to have those three elements present. So before the pesticides come into play, the pest already needs to have the genetic makeup that allows it to develop resistance, plus this kind of really fast generation time and high fecundity. Once you apply the selection pressure to pests that have those elements in their biology, then that's when you start to get pesticide resistance occurring. And Siobhan and James, we've just had a question come through just around timing uh, and repetition of, of using those chemicals. Is there um, some general rules of thumb or guidance that you can provide to the group over how long this develops and um, how much is overusing or repetition when it comes to similar groups of chemicals? Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess, you know, less is always better and it's hard to, to, to come up with, with, with generalities beyond that because a whole range of different factors come into play. So different pests, as, as Siobhan highlighted, which are adapted to a, a wide range of, of host crops are going to, to evolve evolution potentially a lot faster than, than others which are more specific um, to particular crops. So it does depend on, on different factors such as the pest. So it's hard to come up with gener generalities. That being said, for a lot of pests, what we recommend is, is to sort of uh, concentrate all of your um, uh, sprays. If, if you're a multi-volting or multi-generation um, pest that uh, has multiple generations in a year, if you can concentrate the applications to within one generation um, it's, it's going to have less of a selection pressure than if you are um, hitting multiple generations. So that's another generalization that, that, that we often see pop up in the literature. But again, it depends very much on, on the particular context. So it's hard to come up with generalization. And particularly um, at different times of the year, so during winter and autumn, especially down south, you're going to have much longer generation times of pests because they're dependent on temperature for generation time. Um, and so you might have, um, yeah, not have overlapping generations, but when it gets warmer or further up north, say in Queensland, you're going to have overlapping generations of pests, so it's much harder to target those products to a single generation, um, mm. if that's the way we're going with that. So highlighting the importance of really understanding your pest as well, so things around life cycles. Yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, so just to quickly talk about a few of the pests that we know in Australia that have obviously had these three elements um, for evolution resistance and therefore have evolved resistance to many of the chemicals that people try and use to control them. Um, so we've got silver leaf white fly, um, two spotted mite, uh, diamondback moth and green peach aphid. So just to dig a little bit deeper into each of these pests. With the green peach aphid, um, it's a highly polyphagous pest, as I mentioned. You'll find it on pretty much all your vegetable crops. Um, so it causes damage to sucking pests, so it can cause wilting and damage to plants that way. It produces honeydew, so we can have problems with sooty mould. And probably most importantly, it transmits a lot of different viruses. So often the reason for chemical control um, or the economic importance of that pest is concentrated around that virus transmission and trying to stop the movement of viruses into 
and between crops. I've got a list here of um, all of the different mode of action groups and active ingredients that are currently registered in vegetables against this pest. Um, and so they are taken from the APVMA website, the PubChris website. And you can see here that while we have quite a large number of active ingredients and mode of action groups that are registered to control this pest, um, unfortunately, this pest has developed resistance to quite a few of these. So we have a high level of resistance to pyrimacarb and to organophosphates, that's the chlorpyrifos, the dimethylate, and then also a high level of um, resistance to the pyrethroids like permethrin. Um, and then there's a low level of resistance that we've seen recently to the neonicotinoids like imidacloprid, so the new group of confidor. The little map there. Oh, this is the sort of resistance we've seen to pyrimacarb and pyrethroids and um, organophosphates and it's really widespread across Australia. It basically has evolved in a couple of big clones that have just moved across Australia. And worldwide this guy, this pest, has actually um, evolved resistance to more than 80 different insecticides. Luckily we don't have all of those resistances here in Australia, but it's just important to be aware there's the potential for those resistances to evolve. So diamondback moth is uh, probably one of the most destructive pests of uh, brassicas and this guy, um, the caterpillars are really a big problem here. They can um, defoliate plants so seedlings can get real hit really hard and also the caterpillars can um, burrow into the brassica heads and, and pupate inside them causing issues that way as well. Um, the, they have a faster generation time like most insects in summer and in spring where you can have overlapping generations Whereas through winter, it tends to be a longer generation time, around about a month or more. And so there is perhaps only one generation operating at one point in time, but it's very different depending on, on where you are in Australia and what time of year you have. A single female can lay over 100, 150 eggs. Um, so they have that really high fecundity that allows for that kind of, one of those elements of that recipe of evolution resistance. So worldwide, this guy has resistance to more than 80 insecticides again, uh, including the group 28, the diamides, has been noted in some places overseas, and also the BTs as well, resistance in some places overseas as well. Luckily, neither of those resistances have been reported in Australia yet, to my knowledge. Um, but we do have resistance here in Australia to synthetic pyrethroids, nephrins and nephrins and uh, to the organophosphates and also some resistance to the group 6 emectin benzoates as well. So again, that's, it's important to watch that. Sorry, Siobhan, that's pretty concerning at a, at a global level just around resistance emerging, particularly in those group 28s and, and BTs, isn't it? Yeah, so there's as uh, absolutely concerning and there's quite a lot of um, resistance management strategies for this pest that are very prescriptive in terms of how many applications of those group 28 chemicals that you can use per year or per season on mm. this on pest as well. So that those resistance management strategies are absolutely available online. There's a great one on crop life. There's one that's just been developed recently for canola as well that might be useful um, and to really like pay attention to those resistance management strategies and um, how to window those chemicals so that we prevent those resistances evolving in Australia. Um, Uh, Silverleaf whitefly, so this guy is another sucking pest, can get in massive numbers, obviously, especially in warmer temperatures. Um, also is a vector of some viruses and can create the honeydew and the sooty mold problems that we heard about from the aphids as well. Um, so there's lots of different biotypes of, of whitefly, so there's some native um, species that don't have any insecticide resistance. But then there's actually some biotypes that have come in from overseas, biotype B and biotype Q, that actually came into Australia with resistance already. So that's resistance to the organophosphates and to, that's group 1B, or pyrophosphate, the pyrethroids, group 3A, and also to the growth, juvenile growth regulators, group 7C um, as well. And so again, there's a potential for this pest to evolve resistance to a lot of different products. So even though all of these different mode of action groups and all of these different active ingredients are registered to control this pest in vegetable crops in Australia, um, we need to be careful about the use of these different products so that we, again, don't have further resistance evolving. Mm. 
And then finally, we've got the two-spotted mite. Um, so this guy has that, that high um, uh, fecundity and, and the ability for asexual reproduction and really fast um, generation time, especially in warm and drier weather. Um, they can cause damage by um, leaf shriveling and discoloration, obviously, and by sucking the plants dry and cutting into the cells of the leaves. Um, they really have an incredible ability to develop resistance to different chemicals and have sort of been labelled the world's most resistant pest. Um, and so you can see there at some point in time they've evolved resistance in Australia to every single one of the different mode of action groups that are available to control this pest. Um, so in different areas it might be different stories, but definitely at some point in time there's been resistance to every single one of these products. Um, basically, chemicals are not so much a viable option for this pest anymore, especially with synthetic pyrophilogen and organophosphate and some of the miticide. And really, people are turning to non chemical controls um, that can be really effective to control this pest, um, such as using beneficial insects and predatory mites or um, other cultural control options. Mm. Siobhan and James, we've got a couple of questions that have come through. Uh, firstly, from Brock Sutton. Uh, who's commenting that there's been anecdotal evidence of new resistance to group 28 chemicals in diamondback moth and whether or not uh, you had a comment or had seen this uh, out in the field as well. Um, I, I don't have a comment on that at the moment but I'm very happy to look into that um, information and, and get back to you on that one. I don't know. No, I haven't heard of that. I don't know. So something for us to follow up. Uh, with you, Brock, and also a question here from Jeff Robertson. Thanks, Jeff. Um, just asking, does the industry conduct regular testing uh, for insecticide resistance to these pests that we've just walked through? Um, so for some of the pests, so definitely I'm currently involved in a green peach aphid project where we're doing ongoing resistance testing. Um, to see what the basically what there is around in the environment um, ongoing, and also to do sensitivity tests for new products to see um, whether there's any resistance or tolerances building up. So, yep, yeah, that's definitely happening for green pea aphid. Um, I don't know off the top of my head of, of any other projects that are available for other ones, but I think definitely if there are ever any control failures, um, they should be reported obviously to industry and. Um, hopefully will be investigated by state ag departments or by industry and followed up in that way. Um, we're definitely mm. always interested to hear of control failures and for growers to actually collect the survivors of the control failures and send them in so that the resistance testing can be done is a really important step in understanding what's going on there. Just to add to that, uh, Siobhan and James as well, uh, to Jeff's question, there is a new uh, national project looking at agrochemical uh, review and pest prioritisation where these issues can be raised. So Patrick Ariada at, at Ausveg um, is kicking off a national roads show of consultations to identify some of those issues. Um, so started off in Victoria at the end of September. So I'd say over the coming months there will be um, other sites in, in other states with those consultations happening. Um, so, I mean, we've already touched on resistance management a bit already, but um, basically there are a lot of resistance management strategies available for these and other pests that will help manage resistance that already occurs and also hopefully prevent the resistance from occurring. They generally follow the kind of key cornerstone principles of IPM, so you want to monitor your crop, know what's in your crop, you want to make sure that um, you don't spray unless it's absolutely necessary to spray. So as James said, less is more. The less we use the chemicals, the less potential we have for the resistance to evolve. Um, but then if, if it's unavoidable and you really do need to step up and do something to prevent a yield loss or an economic damage to your crop, then it's really important to rotate between those mode of action groups. So if we think back to those first few slides where I was showing the different active ingredients or different products that attack the different parts of the insect, we want to rotate between those different chemicals. We want to rotate between the different mode of action groups to make sure that we're not applying that selection pressure directly onto these populations of insects. 
And so just to walk through it quickly again, we've got the pest um, and we're applying this one mode of action group to um, kill the pest. It's working well at first and then in subsequent generations we start to select for the more tolerant members of that population and start to select for resistance. However, if we can mix that up and the first spray that we do, we go with a group 3A or we go with one particular mode of action group that targets one part of the pest and then the next spray that you do you are able to use a different mode of action group and target a different part of the pest, then you'll basically keep the pest guessing in a way. I mean, you'll wipe out the, the different tolerances that are available and keep the pest populations low. So the key to halting the evolution of resistance in its track is to really rotate between those different modes of actions of targeting the pests. Um, and obviously, Beneficial insects are a really important part of, of IPM and, and of controlling different pests. As I mentioned already with the two-spot mite, this little guy here, um, chemical control is really not an option in a lot of places. And so um, it's really great to look at promoting um, beneficial insects and looking at ways to promote beneficial insects in your crop. So there's a host of, of different insects. Predatory mites are particularly wonderful at cleaning up two-spot. Um, and they're around and they're also available for purchase, I believe, from various different companies like Bug for Bugs for Bugs and other companies available out there. There's a tiny little ladybird beetle that is, is good, um, a mite specific predator. And there's more generalist predators like lace wings that will also be effective there. Um, if your problem happens to be with aphids, then we have um, a bunch of different options. There's uh, parasitic wasps like um, Aphidias that are quite specific to aphids and they'll um, lay their larvae inside the aphids and you'll see lots of these lovely golden mummies um, in your aphid populations that indicate you've got a healthy parasitic wasp population going on. Hoverfly larvae um, are really great at cleaning up aphid populations as well as, of course, as the, the ladybirds as well. They're voracious predators of aphids. <clears throat> um, we've also got um, specific parasitoids for uh, different white fly, so um, things like Encarsia um, that are really great. They're quite specific um, parasitoid predators of white flies, and there's lepidopt lepidopteran specific um, parasitoids as well that can target DBM, as well as these general predators like spiders and, and, and lace wings and, and other general predators that are great to have in the cr crop because they'll basically get rid of a lot of your pests. So, sort of understanding how to have a healthy ecosystem in your crop is a really important part of, of resistance management and, and IPM. And Siobhan, yeah. just on beneficials, um, you mentioned look, it's great to have those in there. Um, highlights really the importance of ID and knowing what you do have. Uh, we've had a question come in just around how you do attract and retain some of these beneficials like predatory mites and uh, wasps in your crop, uh, particularly at such a large scale in commercial horticulture. Yep. Yeah, and that, and that can be that can be really difficult. Um, you know, some of these populations, particularly when they're sort of more, um, they're not great dispersers like mites, but are really important for biological control. They can they can take a sort of a number of, of years to build up properly, but if you go in and, and wipe them out with a um, uh, with a broad spectrum uh, pesticide, um, then then that's the, the, potentially that you've, you've lost a, a bit of um, uh, effort that's gone into building up that, that base population. Um, you potentially have better luck with with your more mobile um, uh, predators, so such as your your, your wasps and your um, lace wings and, and things that can fly in. But yes, yeah, it's, it's a real difficulty juggling that. Um, maintenance of your beneficial populations with with using um, these chemical options. So uh, as Carl mentioned, um, identification is key. So it's, it's really important to know what's out there, um, what are your key pests, and what are their key beneficials. Um, so, you, so whether or not you're IDing them yourself or using an advisor, it's just really important to do that part of it properly, because that is going to inform um, the rest of your, your uh, management strategies. And, and often it can be really difficult to actually get a sense of what um, predators are 
are out there, particularly if they're, they're parasites rather than predators. I mean, how do you know the proportion of um, your caterpillars that, that might be parasitized? So in this case, you, you may need to go back several times and, and, and reassess the populations. And, and is the pest population increasing um, while the, the predators stay constant or, or are they kind of leveling out a bit? Because that's a really good sign that, that you, you potentially can, can withhold those sprays and maintain those, those beneficial populations. Mm. Thanks, James. Uh, yeah. Some other suggestions I've seen uh, include if it's possible to change the microclimate to advantage the beneficial insects instead of the pests. So mites will often prefer um, a more dry environment. So if it's possible to increase the humidity, humidity say in a greenhouse type situation, and that might be one way to kind of shift things in favour of the beneficials. Yeah. Or um, I've also seen um, suggesting using cover crops uh, with uh, types of um, food sources for the parasitic wasps that might attract them into the crop as well. Um, there's definitely research out there on, on those kind of options as well. Uh, so James mentioned briefly um, that it's really important to know what's in your crop um, and what's going on in your crop uh, in terms of the beneficials that you have there as well as your pests before choosing um, to use a chemical to control your pests. Uh, because of, obviously these chemicals can sometimes wipe out the beneficial populations at the same time as they're controlling the pests. So for example, if you go in um, with one chemical, a broad spectrum chemical, so typically pyrethroids and organophosphates can be more broad spectrum, these chemicals can often have quite a high effect on the pest knocking out the pests, but at the same time, they're going to have a really damaging effect on your beneficial populations as well. And so while you control your pests, you wipe out your beneficials, and then any other um, pests that might have been in lower numbers, numbers in the crop, they may have been being controlled by those beneficial insects, might flare up after you've wiped out all of those beneficial insects. Uh, if you actually go for a more selective chemical or more selective chemical option to spray on your crop. So say um, pyramol is a really great example. It's quite selective on aphids, so it can have a really damaging effect on the aphid population, but it can be much softer and is less effective at killing beneficials. So it's really important to look for those selective um, chemicals that will harm your pest, the target pest population that you've got, and, and won't really hurt the beneficial population. So again, it's a case of really knowing what you've got in your crop, IDing the pest that's there and knowing what level it's at. Um, and then if you are going to choose to use a chemical, hopefully go for something that's more selective at targeting the pest rather than targeting the beneficial um, insects. And I guess on that on that note, the other important thing to pay attention to is, is also the residual activity of the particular chemical that you're putting out. And as I mentioned earlier, if, if you've got some pretty mobile beneficials that, that you've identified will be helpful for controlling your, your pests, they will really benefit from having a, a short residual um, so they can potentially recolonize um, the, the crop a lot, a lot faster and clean up the, the rest of the pests that the um, pesticide didn't manage to um, get um, in, a, in a shorter duration of time. So, so, you know, a matter of, of days rather than, than weeks, week-long residuals. And the best way to get that information, James, uh, is where, just around residue and when you can uh, expect to see beneficials back in. Yeah, so this this um, is often on, on labels, but there's uh, chemical companies are often publish um, additional so supplementary information on, on the chemical the, and the activity of the chemical. Um, so there's, there's a wealth of resources out there um, available, um, sometimes better than others. So, so it can be tricky making, making the choice, um, but, but yeah, we just have to, we have to make do with what information is out there. Uh, it's a nice segue, thanks Carl. Um, so we, we've compiled this table as part of the green peach aphid resistance management strategy that we developed for Bundaberg um, fewer vegetable crops. Um, a lot of this information has come from um, the cotton um, industry, have a, a wealth of information on um, the way that different chemicals interact with beneficials. There's a couple of big groups in Europe, um, the BioVest group and the Copert um, group as well, and they both have some really great websites that, and they've done a lot of research on the side effects of different chemicals on beneficial insects. And, and there's other information out there. I mean, this is obviously 
incomplete, as you can see, um, and I don't think there's any one place that has it all together. But um, if you go to a few of these different resources, then hopefully it can help you to build a picture about what different chemicals that you might select to use um, on your pests that will hopefully um, mean that the beneficial insects won't be as harmed. It's an excellent table, Siobhan. I guess one of the things you do notice looking at it is that there's no one product or insecticide that doesn't have some form of impact on a, on a beneficial. Um, you know, the lowest there, I think the rating is low in the light green. Um, just interested in, in your comments on that. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, when you get down to these more selective chemicals, kind of up this end, where they've been uh, developed to really target um, specific pests and, and have less than an effect on beneficials, obviously there's so many different um, types of beneficial species out there. There's predatory beetles, predatory bugs, mites, spiders, the hymenoptera, um, and also, of course, uh, like being careful of bees as well as another beneficial in the crop. And um, they're going to have a different relationships to the pests that you're trying to control. Um, so obviously products that are, are effective against um, aphids and bugs like that may also be quite, um, quite highly toxic to things like the predatory bugs, which come from a similar um, genetic background. So things like transforms or floxiflora is highly effective against aphids. And why, uh, while it might not be so bad against, say, spiders, um, it's going to be really, um, it's very high against uh, like a type of uh, bug, like aquadipin bug. Um, and so if you're going out and, and you've got aphids in your crop, but you notice also you have some of these other um, beneficial predators out there, then it might be important to try and select a different product that you could use that might have a lower impact on the beneficials in your crop. Mm. And you mentioned, uh, Siobhan, it's really hard to find uh, a, one resource that collates everything together. I mean, we've got a great example here with green peach aphid. Um, are you aware with the other pests that we walk through around diamondback moth, uh, two-spotted mite, and um, the white fly, any other great resources out there that might be a good go-to in, in the first instance that do collate it together? Uh, so the cotton industry is, uh, has a similar table that is much more exten extensive than this one. It includes all of the products that are registered for control in cotton. So that might include some of those products that aren't in this table that are registered against Dimeback moth or white fly, for example. Uh, it's tricky because some of that work has been done specifically for cotton. So in a different environment, it might be a slightly different story about how effective those different chemicals are um, at you know, selecting for or against different beneficials. But again, it's a great place to start. That's a really uh, wealth of information there. And definitely the um, BioVest group um, have um, a lot more products available on their website than, than I've like listed here um, and a lot more beneficials as well. So if you want to look for specific ones, it might be worth going to the BioVest website or the Copper Biological Systems website to look through your specific product. Well, they won't, they won't have the specific product, but if you search by active, um, yep. that's probably the best way to, to go about it. Yeah. 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 Right. Cool. Um, so, as we mentioned already, um, less is more in terms of managing resistance in, in pests in your crops. So, it's better to um, hold up on spraying unless you know that you absolutely need to. Um, so monitoring and, and knowing what you have in your crops is, is the utmost importance there. A little example here is um, down the bottom we've got a picture of some different aphids. Um, on the left we've got green peach aphid, which is that resistant pest that I mentioned earlier. Um, and then a, a host of different other aphids that you might find in your vegetable crops, say turnip and cabbage aphids, um, turn up in brassicas and potato or box five aphids and cotton melon aphids in, in other fruiting vegetables. And um, they all look really similar, um, so it can be really hard. And while green peach aphid is resistant to a host of different chemicals, a lot of these other guys are still susceptible, particularly to pyramor, um, which is a really great targeted aphid product that you can use. So it's important if you look in your crop and you see green, green aphid, um, try and grab a hand lens or maybe take a photo um, or ask an advisor and get a closer look. Because if it's not green peach aphid, then you might have more options available. 
um, for controlling, or you might not even need to spray because some of these other species don't transmit viruses and therefore are less economically important to control. Mm. Um, with monitoring, it's really important to know where in the crop to look for your pests. So again, for example, green peach aphid tend to inhabit the lower leaves of, of plants, that's where they like to hang out, whereas like turnip and cabbage aphid tend to form clusters on flower spikes. So a, a knowledge of the biology can really help inform um, what pests that you found in your crop and um, help you to know like what options you might therefore um, have available or need to know. Um, different um, pests were, and beneficials will have abundances at different time of the year. So an understanding of the seasonal abundances. Um, there's some great online resources there. I think pest facts on our, um, the CESA website, we have um, some different seasonal abundances of typical pests. So you can look to see in autumn, it might be a, a bad time of year for green peach aphid, whereas in spring it, it might be worse for DVM. And so understanding like when the high populations of that pest are going to be present or when high populations will be beneficial. So spring tends to be a really great time for beneficials um, in your crops. And so it's, therefore it's less likely that you'll need to, um, to spray because the beneficial populations are so high, they're controlling the pest populations for you already. Um, hand lenses, like 10 times magnification are really good, or having, you can buy little um, macro lenses you can pop on your phone and take photos and send them into various different um, ID services or um, information services to help get that identification. And sticky traps are also really great to have monitoring out in your crop to get an idea of build up of particularly flying pest or beneficial populations. You might see a flight of hoverflies have come in because they're caught on the like, sticky traps. So you might not need to worry so much about spraying. Or you might see um, the aphid populations of DBM are starting to really build up. And so um, start monitoring more intensively actually within the crop. So those sticky traps can be really helpful in that way. Um, there's economic thresholds are also available for some pests. And so understanding like at what level the pest population starts to become economically important for your crop. Obviously through your own experience, you'll have some idea of that, but as well, uh, things like aphids and whiteflies that can vector viruses, lower numbers um, of those species might be important to control so you don't get virus spread. Whereas other aphid species like non-green peach aphid, it might be okay to let them go for a while um, and let some beneficial start to bring in some control and some suppression of those populations because they're not going to be as economically important at the same numbers. So there's information out there on economic thresholds as well. I would just add um, to take the economic thresholds with a grain of salt. Um, uh, most of them don't, don't consider the impact of uh, beneficial populations. So if you do have a um, presence of, of beneficials in your in your population and, and they are building up then, then that um, that economic threshold is actually going to be an underestimate potentially. Mm. So. Mm. One common question we get uh, James and Siobhan just around monitoring is uh, if you know you've got uh, high pest pressure how often should you be out in the crop um, looking for these things um, in terms of regularity is there any guidance you can provide there? I mean, are they using examples or times of year? Um, so with aphids, uh, we know that the, the populations tend to get quite high in autumn. So at the start of autumn, you might want to monitor for a bit and then definitely down south in the colder parts of the year, it's less important um, to monitor as regularly. Um, but especially, I, I think it will depend on um, the stage of your crop. So you might be, the crop stage might be um, more um, so, so sensitive to the pest at a certain time. So say um, when uh, broccoli is, is creating um, the florets, might be important to be monitoring quite regularly for DBM. Whereas when you know a seedling or at a different stage, it, it may be less important. So it's going to be really targeted at what crop you're growing and at what time of year that, that went in and understanding like how that plays in with the biology of the pest. Um, and going out, yeah, I, above, above and beyond that, I, I wouldn't be able to have any specific guidelines. Yeah, again, it's, it's just one of those those difficulties where, where horses for courses, um, uh, 
you know, it depends where, 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 what part of your crop the pest is damaging, um, when, when beneficials are likely uh, to kick in, and, and, and the frequency with which you need to monitor for, for, for beneficials, because again, that their life cycles vary, and that's going to vary. So I, I think as a general advice, you just going back to the monitoring and, and um, identification, which is the cornerstone of, of monitoring. If you can identify your key pests and your key beneficials, then you, you can then seek um, further advice as to the appropriate um, uh, monitoring frequency and, and, and control options that you, that you do have under a variety of different scenarios. I'm sure there's a lot of advisors out there with um, specific knowledge around different pests that will be able to help with that mm. as well. Yeah, so the uh, importance of asking questions too of, of those um, that do provide advisory services is really important. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and it can save you a lot of money and, and wasted sprays uh, by, by making mm -hmm. sure you've got the right pest and beneficial there. Absolutely. Um, there's other uh, non-chemical control methods that you can use as well as, as making sure that you've got your beneficials in your crops. Um, one of the main uh, cornerstones of, of IP of resistance management, rather as well as um, rotating between different chemistries and not spraying unless you absolutely have to is, is not using insurance sprays. Uh, so sometimes people have thought that prophylactic sprays might prevent certain pests moving into a crop or prevent viruses. Uh, I've got some graphs down here um, on the right of a little um, test pilot bioassay we did looking at the effects of pyrethroids on uh, green peach aphids and we've got some, we have a resistant population of aphids here and a susceptible population of aphids and basically we did a little deep leaf dip assay where we put the leaves in a pyrethroid, um, alpha cyclomethrin it was, and then we, we put it on an um, agar dish and introduced some resistant aphids to some leaves and introduced some susceptible aphids to some other leaves and then basically counted how many were still on the leaves at different points in time. So after one hour, after 24 hours and after 48 hours, to try and give a bit of an indication of what might happen in the field if you were to do a prophylactic spray and then what you might expect to see aphids doing. And you can see here, unfortunately, the resistant aphids are just happily feeding even just one hour after exposure to those um, pyrethroid um, dipped leaves. So as you can see here, because most of the green peach aphid populations in Australia are resistant, um, a, a prophylactic spray of pyrethroid to try and prevent them feeding is, is probably not really going to have an effect. And um, monitoring and also a prophylactic spray of something like a pyrethroid is going to wipe out your beneficials as well. So um, it's better just not to use insurance sprays and to only spray when it's absolutely economically necessary. Um, some other um, non-chemical control methods might be using wind barriers between crops to avoid wind assisted pest movement or, or planting crops upwind um, to prevent the wind blowing the pests from um, older crops into new crops. Um, eliminating weeds is super important to create host free periods during the year. So eliminating weeds that are hosts for uh, silver leaf white fly like sow thistle and things like and lucerne around a property can prevent um, when your crop's finished, then there's nowhere for them to continue to survive and breed afterwards if you can remove those weeds. Also eliminating weeds that are hosts of viruses can prevent virus transmission. So papaya ring spot virus, which is transmitted by green peach aphid and a few other aphid species. Um, there's some wild weed hosts that can also um, have host that virus. So making sure you remove those kind of wild melon species weeds can mean that there's um, you can reduce the uh, likelihood of that virus moving into your crop. And as I mentioned before, if it's possible to change the microclimate to benefit your beneficials or benefit your plants as opposed to your pests, um, that can always be another way that you can help to kind of promote the healthy um, ecosystem that, that keeps those pests in check in your crops. Um, but yeah, again, most importantly, if you are using chemicals to so just rotate between those mode of action groups and just another point on that is um, sometimes it, forget that if you say apply an irrigation, a drip um, irrigation application of something like Jurevo, which has um, a neonicotinoid, which is um, thiamethoxam, and also a group 28 chemical in it as well. So your crop, you might have applied that, it's going to protect your crop for a certain amount of time. It's really important then your first spray after that 
is not from those stone mode of action groups. So you've applied your ego, um, and once that guy's worn off, you don't want to apply anything else from a group 28 or from a group um, 4A. So you don't want to apply your Manex, so your Confidors or Nuprids, and you don't want to apply uh, your Corrigan or your Benevia after that because they're from the same mode of action group. Even though they've been delivered in different ways to the crop, it's going to have the same effect as that constant selection pressure on your pest. So making sure that you really are aware of those mode of actions in the products that you're using and the different ways that those products are being applied um, and making sure that you're rotating between the mode of actions of every chemical that's being applied to your crop. Um, so that's uh, all of the kind of slides that we have for today and as we've mentioned throughout the talk, um, there's just a whole host of different resources out there um, on the internet and um, through your advisors, through agrochemical companies as well that can really help you to understand what's going on in your crop. The APVMA has all of the different registered chemicals obviously for your crop. IRAC website has some great information on different types of resistance. Um, crop Life has a host of different resistance management strategies for most of the pests we've mentioned today. So that's a really great resource to head over to Crop Life and see they've got resistance management strategies for um, silverleaf whitefly and for DVM. I think also for two spot mite, but maybe not in vegetable crops and for green peach aphid as well. Um, obviously, the Integrated Crop Protection Group um, and Soil Wealth have good resources. It's, at Caesar Australia, we have a lot of pages on the different biology of different pests as well as resistance management strategies that we've developed such as the green peach aphid in Bundaberg field crops and um, we've also played a part in developing a resistance management strategy for DBM in canola crops which might have some interesting or important information that could apply. Um, the cotton industry has a wealth of information out there on the different pests that get into cotton but also obviously get into vegetable crops as well so that's a really good place to go for information on chemicals, um, resistance management, and also beneficial species and the interaction of those chemicals and beneficial species. Um, in terms of um, helping to ID what's in your crop, um, you can always tweet us a picture at Pest Facts Caesar and we will do what we can to help ID the, whatever insect that you've found. Um, and also there's a great, some great apps out there that can help you do identification like the Veg Pest ID app that was developed by AHR. Um, and then those European groups that have done a lot of work on um, beneficial insects and the side effects of different chemicals on those insects. So, yeah, it's unfortunately about um, putting together the information um, that's out there in order to help you understand how to um, control the pests in your crop in the most economically useful way. Mm. It's a really useful short list there too. As you mentioned before, James, there is so much information out there and sometimes it is difficult to... Uh, determine where to start and what is good versus um, not so reliable information. Um, and just a reminder too, we do have those handouts on the side panel there if you haven't already had a chance to download those. Uh, the floor is now open for the short amount of time we do have left because we've been taking quite a few questions um, throughout the webinar. Um, and we've just had a question come through, um, are we able to get it? copy of the PDF and yes, just a reminder, both this session um, in terms of the video of the webinar will be recorded along with a PDF of the slides on the Soil Wealth website and we'll distribute that to everyone um, that's registered and attended today. One thing uh, I wanted to just to revisit, Siobhan and James, was just around resistance and is all resistance equal. Um, you had some slides further back around you know, the evolution of that. It would be interesting just to get your thoughts and, um, and comments on, on that. Um, so yeah, absolutely there's different types of resistance and it, it's not all equal. Um, so um, in my previous talk um, on green peach aphids I mentioned that in a lot of detail but um, basically um, there's kind of two type, main types of resistance which is metabolic resistance and then target site resistance. So metabolic resistance is when I talked about the genetic tools that the um, species already have of detoxifying chemicals. So it can often be a, a lower starting resistance and low to moderate. It's the more common kind of resistance and definitely for green peach aphid, that's the type of resistance we've seen against neonicotinoids is that metabolic resistance where 
Um, a chemical may still work, um, but there is some tolerance in the populations. So say for organophosphates, um, if you use a much higher rate, then it might still control the population, but there's definitely a trend towards tolerance building up in the green peach aphid populations. But definitely, for example, with the metacloprid and green peach aphid populations, although we have noticed low resistance, a shift in the tolerance in those populations, those products are still able to control the green peach aphid populations. So judicious use of those products may prolong the life of them as, as effective products to control those pests. On the other hand, when you have target site resistance, then what has happened is the insect has evolved a way to get around the mode of action of that chemical um, affecting them at all. So the chemical will be of no use. It won't kill them anymore. And even if you spray 100,000 times the rate, um, unless you drown it, you're pretty much not going to kill the insect using that chemical mode of action. Um, so that's a much um, more devastating type of resistance that we see. We have often see that type of resistance evolving to the pyrethroids and the organophosphates. And definitely overseas, target site resistance has evolved to neonicotinoids in some pests as well. So mm -hmm. there's different types of resistance and it's, it's important to know what type of resistance there is. Um, I think on that note, um, different kind of resistances have different fitness costs. So a, a fitness cost is essentially where the, where the insect that is resistant has a penalty for being resistant. So maybe it, it produces less offspring or it doesn't grow so well. So what can actually happen is in the absence of selecting for resistance, you'll actually see a decrease in resistance through time if without chemicals being applied um, due to that cost. So the susceptible individuals will actually outcompete the resistant individuals. So it's, it's, it's another argument for, for withholding um, chemical sprays or only spraying when you really need to because um, you, you potentially will see like resistance is not necessarily just here to stay, but it, it can, because of this fitness cost, can decrease with time if sprays or selection pressure is removed. Hmm. And that gets back to the importance of, of ID and monitoring and not calendar spraying, isn't it, James? Exactly. Absolutely. Excellent. And just to follow up on your point earlier, Siobhan, just around the previous webinar, we ran on green peach aphid resistance. That recording is, is up on the Soil Wealth ICP website if you did want to view that. I'm just conscious of time and we do want to make the commitment to finish up within the hour. So Siobhan, James, thank you very much to, to you and, and sharing your expertise today. It's been excellent. Um, we've had a good level of questioning throughout um, from quite a few people. So thank you too for taking part. Uh, as I mentioned, this uh, presentation and the recording will be up on, on the website and we'll share that link with you uh, within the next day so you can go back and revisit it. And just on a, a concluding remark, the next uh, webinar we are running is in conjunction with Enviroveg, Ausveg, um, on soil and nutrition management and getting an update from Andrew Shaw um, and Dr Doris Blasing from RMCG as well as hearing from some growers um, about the EnviroVeg program with a specific focus on nitrogen. If you wanted to um, join that event, that's up now to register on, on the Soil Wealth ICP website. But look, thank you very much to the presenters and um, for taking part and we'll see you at the next webinar. Thanks everyone. Thanks.